Hello, everyone. Uh, we're just getting the last of you across the book, the line, the digital line into class. <clears throat> so welcome to this 63rd, 63rd webinar, webinar on the secret doctrine. I found a new uh, esoteric artist, another woman like so many um, that uh, painted in the first half of the last century. And uh, so I'll be using her work for the next few times. This uh, webinar series is available on Makara.us under the subheading Moria Federation webinars, then webinar series in progress. All episodes of this, the Secret Teaching of All Ages and the Treatise on Cosmic Fire series are also available on YouTube. Just do a search for Francis Donald and the webinar series you'd like to view. They usually get posted a few days after the webinar. You can register for any of these webinars on the homepage of moriafederation.com. It's just right up here in the left hand corner. Alrighty. This month in Old Diary Leaves, Colonel Olcott tells the story of Alphonse Cahagné, whose wife Adele was an ecstatic visionary. So, could we get a reader, please? At about this time, news was received from Paris that our sole surviving French honorary fellow, Alphonse, the yeah, let's call him Alphonse, was dead. <laughs> Okay, was dead. Yeah. He and the late Baron du Poti were our only two, and both were distinguished authorities in physical science. Psychical. Yes, psychical. Science. That I read was his celestial telegraph, which appeared in its English translation at New York in about the year 1851. It was almost the first of my reading about the clairvoyant faculty and modern ecstatical visions of the world of spirits. Unfortunately, I never had the chance of conversing with its honest and enthusiastic author, but he sent me his photograph and that of his wife, the ecstatic Adele, which I keep hanging in my private rooms. Not a visitor has ever guessed that the heavy-bodied peasant woman of the picture was even a clairvoyant at all, let alone that soaring visionaries whose soul flights through space took her to super... ...supernal planes drove back the less ethereal clairvoyants whom Cahogne sometimes set uh, to watching her in her upward progress. Thank you, Bia. Did you, did you get all of that? I keep uh, you getting cut out. You, more or less, you cut out a couple of times. Um, yeah, I got my internet <laughs> thing. Sorry. You no, know, people are reading along, hopefully, and so um, yeah. Okay, uh, another reader, please. Yvonne, can you read that for us, please? Sure. <clears throat> Elsewhere, when writing on the subject of clairvoyance, I have quoted from Kahane book his description of the agony felt by him on finding himself powerless to draw Adele's soul back into her body when she felt so merged in the spirit sphere as to declare she should never re-enter the corpse that seemed so repugnant to her. He tells us that the body began to even change color like a real corpse and show the preliminary signs of decomposition while he, in the greatest distress and fear, vainly brought his strongest will to bear upon her soul to come back and not leave him to be perhaps tried for murdering the adored wife of his bosom. Poor man, his plight is one that many have <laughs> and anyone may experience. The last resource that he employed was prayer to God, which succeeded. 
Of course, it would in the case of a man of his temperament, for by praying, he raised his consciousness and yearning to the celestial levels of which Adele was functioning, and so got into touch with her as he could not by the mere use of his brain power. If one sets out to chase a bird, one must get bird's wings and fly after it. To walk on the ground will be useless. <laughs> Thank you. It's just amazing the stuff that comes to light through Olcott's pen. All right, last month we began the first of two interim sections that HPB chose to insert between her commentary on verse four, which we've now finished, and verse five of stanza six, which will commence in about 30 plus pages. At the very beginning of this section, we learned that 11 stanzas detailing the formation of the planetary chains had been omitted from the secret doctrine. We then took a look at uh, the number and geometry of the seven chains of the Earth's scheme, followed by an examination of a chart that compares the seven human principles and the planetary globes of a chain. HPB then introduced the concept of planetary globes as entities, citing historical personages that supported this concept. We finished with this quote, for earth is only the footstool of man in his ascension to higher regions, the vestibule to glorious mansions through which a moving crowd forever press. And that brings us to where we left off, referencing this quote on the very next page. HPB continues. Can we get a reader, please? Greg, can you read that for us, please? Greg? Hi. Um, I was trying to, I needed to unmute my stuff. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, but this only shows how admirably the occult philosophy fits everything in nature and how much more logical are its tenets than the lifeless hypothetical speculations of physical science. Having learned thus much, the mystic will be better prepared to understand the occult teaching, though every formal student of modern sciences may and probably will regard it as a preposterous nonsense. The student of occultism, however, holds that the theory at present under discussion is far more philosophical, philosophical and probable than any other. It is, a more, it is more logical at any rate than the theory recently advanced, which made of the moon the projection of a portion of our earth excluded when the latter was but a globe in fusion a molten plastic mass. Extruded, yes. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let's continue. Can we get a reader, please? Uh, Vivian, can you read that, please? <clears throat> it, is, it is said that the planetary chains, having their days and their nights, i.e. periods of activity or life, and of inertia or death, and behave in heaven as do men on earth. They generate their likes, get old, and become personally extinct, their spiritual principles only living in their progeny as a survival of themselves. Without attempting the very difficult task of giving out the whole process in all its cosmic details, enough may be said to give an approximate idea of it. When a planetary chain is in its last round, its globe one or A, before finally dying out, sends all its energy and principles into a neutral center of latent force, a Laya center, <clears throat> and thereby informs a new nucleus of undifferentiated substance or matter, i.e. calls it into activity or gives it life. Suppose such a process to have taken place in the lunar planetary chain, Suppose again, for argument's sake, though Mr. Darwin's theory quoted below has lately been upset, even if the fact has not yet been ascertained by mathematical calculation, 
that the moon is far older than the Earth. Imagine the six fellow globes of the moon, aeons before the first globe of our seven was evolved, just in the same position in relation to each other <clears throat> as the fellow globes of our chain occupy in regard to our Earth now. See in esoteric Buddhism, the constitution of man and the planetary chain. Thank you, Vivian. Okay, first. It is said that the planetary chains, having their days and their nights, that is, periods of activity or life, and of inertia or death. This statement confirms the concept of pralaya, or night, as it's here called, which is a period of abstraction between chains, just as there is between solar system, between globes, between root races, even between human incarnations. Next, and behave in heaven as do men on earth. They generate their likes, get old, and become personally extinct, their spiritual principles only living in their progeny as a survival of themselves. This last phrase is curious. For, for it to be accurate, the term progeny would need to refer to future rebirths not to a person's physical children, though there is something akin to spiritual fitness that transfers through the bloodline. Not always, but uh, often. Okay, yeah, by the way, if you have any thoughts or questions at any time, um, please feel free to raise your hand. So after this introductory sentence, HPD, go. You, I, you got a hand, just as you said that. Okay, so Francis, are you saying that they it, it transfers the life force to the next one? That's correct, and we're going to be getting into it right now in detail. Okay, thank you. So it's not just it's not just a passing comment. She now, she now. really buckles down and 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 describes this, uh, and we'll be we'll be. Uh, examining it. Okay, so HPB takes us into the weeds on this subject of the transference of the life wave from chain to chain. Quote, when a planetary chain is in its last round, it's globe one or A, before finally dying out, sends all its energy and principles into a neutral center of latent force. Alaya Center, and thereby informs a new nucleus of undifferentiated substance or matter, that is, calls it into activity or gives it life. So, you know, this is incredibly occult information, the, spe the specific nature of it, but as we'll find out, it gets even more specific. Um, as we've, you know, we've been reading about, about Laia or Leia centers now for some time, and it's what distinguishes it is that it's made up of undifferentiated substance. Um, and that neutrality allows for the force to be reconstituted in such a way that when it begins the new round, um, it can hearken to the to the qualitative aspect of that new round compared to the round it just left. Uh, we'll use the transference from the third or Saturn chain to our fourth Earth chain just to illustrate this concept. So when a planetary chain is in its last round, that is when the life wave that passes through the seven globes that make up a chain is on its seventh and last pass or round, globe one, before finally dying out, sends all its energy and principles into a neutral center of latent force, a Leia center, and thereby informs a new nucleus of undifferentiated substance or matter, that is, calls it into activity or gives it life. 
Next, suppose such a process to have taken place in the lunar planetary chain. This is what uh, came to be called the moon chain, which we discover in a treatise on cosmic fire is not the same as the Saturn third chain, but we'll get into that distinction later. Next, suppose that the moon is far older than the earth. Here HPB sets the stage for the moon being the fourth globe of the previous chain, the globe D as you can see here. Next, imagine the six fellow globes of the moon eons before the first globe of our seven was evolved, just in the same position in relation to each other as the fellow globes of our chain occupy in regard to our Earth now. So here HPB posits the idea that the seven globes of our current Earth chain occupy the same relative position as the seven globes of the moon chain held in that distant time. Here's a chart from uh, chart one from the Secret Doctrine that relates the relative position of the seven planets of each plane. Each of them is a septenary that moves from the most etheric down to the to the um, uh, most physical, and then up and in, back into the etheric realm. And so, here are the two chains: lunar and Earth chain described in that way, and the nature of their transference, but we'll get into that more. Okay, next up, can we get a reader, please? Uh, Kirsten, can you read that for us, please? And now it will be easy to imagine further globe A of the lunar chain informing globe A of the terrestrial chain and dying. Globe B of the former sending after that its energy into globe B of the new chain. Then globe C of the lunar creating its progeny sphere C of the terrain chain. Then the moon, our satellite, pouring forth into the lowest globe of our planetary ring, globe D, our Earth, all its life, energy, and powers, and having transferred, transferred them to a new center, becoming virtually a dead planet in which rotation has almost ceased since the birth of our globe. Thank you. Okay, first, and now it will be easy to imagine further globe A of the lunar chain informing globe A of the terrestrial chain and dying. So first we have the beginning of the transference of the life wave from one chain to the next when globe one, quote, sends all its energy and principles into a neutral center of latent force, thus initiating a chain pralaya after which the life wave is further transferred to globe one of the new chain. Next, globe B of the former, sending after that its energy into globe B of the new chain, then globe C of the lunar, creating its progeny sphere C of the terrene chain. So we might assume that each of these globe transferences includes an intermediate Leia center where Pralaya occurs before the final transfer to the new chain. Finally, there the moon, our satellite, pouring forth into the lowest globe of our planetary ring, globe D, our Earth, all its life, energy, and powers, and having transferred them to a new center, becoming virtually a dead planet in which rotation has almost ceased since the birth of our globe. Same method of transference, but this time the globes are the moon and the earth. The globes sequentially move into Pralaya, that 
layer of abstraction where they remain for some time before re-emerging to inhabit a new chain. Now, some schools of thought include these Leia centers within a system of 12 globes, of these upper five globes, seven manifest, five pralayic, and associate them with the 12 astrological signs. So uh, that, that other place in the solar system that is projected out of globe A is actually into one of these pralayic globes. Next up, can we get a reader? If you have any questions, if you're not Scott, following, can... then uh, please let me know because if you aren't, there's going to be five other people that aren't too. So, um, you know, this is kind of moves fast and furiously along. So it's it would be useful if you if you could hold um, or stay up with it. The concepts aren't really that difficult. Sometimes the language gets a little uh, obtuse. I saw a hand. I see two hands. Yeah, we've got a couple of hands now, and then and then we'd like Scott to read. But okay, Robert, go ahead first, and then Joe. Uh, Francis, where did that last diagram come from? This one, yeah. I don't. I got it off the. Uh, I I didn't get it from its source, Robert. I got it from. Um, uh, from a word search for planetary uh, chains and globes. And uh, and I came up with this diagram and I didn't, uh, okay. I didn't give it its assignation. If you do the same search, you might find it. You know, it might be in, um, in fact, I would say there's a good chance it's in one of De Peruker's books mm -hmm. uh, because he holds to this seven globe concept and I have a vague memory of this illustration occurring in one of those books. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Next. I have to go back to basics. Uh, Joe Garceau. Yeah, it's me. Um, I have to go back to basics. I thought the very first picture that you showed was running from seven, six, five, four to one. And then when it transferred, it went from one to one. And if I understand that correctly, then we're talking about going from positive to negative as the transfers are made. Uh, let me think about that. From a, from a positive to a negative. Well, it, this would work in this what you're saying would work in this sense energetically would work in this sense um that the negative polarized vehicle always um acts to draw in the the positively polarized vehicle it's it uh the law of attraction works from the negative drawing in the positive right right uh, and from the positive emanating uh, towards the negatively polarized. So just based on that, um, I would say there's, you know, it's a good hypothesis. I didn't quite follow you when you were talking about 7654, that part. Uh, it's, what even, it's even earlier, Francis. It was the, I think the very first picture that you showed of a chain. So I have trouble with this language. Um, okay, I, it, that, I think that one that, no, the one that you just had up pre, just prior, right there. I believe what you said was it goes all the way around and when it gets to one, it transfers and it goes over here to the other side and I get the impression that that is the opposite in the second globe. It's the opposite of what it was in the first globe. Oh. Uh, Okay, well, what I meant is that when you, okay, let's get our nomenclature down just for right. a bit because yeah, sometimes, I have trouble well, with it. It's, yeah, I know, and everybody does, you know, until you get used to it, it's, that's not unusual at all. So the chain is a chain of seven actual globes. 
around is the transference of the life wave from globe to globe. So, you, you know, that in a chain, for instance, the seven globes all exist simultaneously. <clears throat> uh, they don't pop in and out of existence. Uh, the round within that chain determines the transfer of, of the life. So when you say you're on the fourth round, which we are on this earth chain, uh, I mean, this earth uh, scheme, um, and we're also on the fourth chain. But when we say we're on the fourth round, what it means is, is that um, the, sequentially, this is the fourth time that seven globes have been visited and revisited, right? We also happen to be on the fourth globe of that fourth chain, I mean, <laughs> of that fourth round, which means that in this round, which is the life wave passing from globe to globe, we've gone halfway through this round. So the chain is the physical nomenclature of seven globes, and the round is the passage of the life wave through those globes. Okay? Does that make sense? So the other six globes exist, but they're quiescent in terms of the uh, of the human kingdom's life wave. Okay, so that's just that's to set up the nomenclature. <laughs> I know it's the words get in the way because the concepts are have to use, so it's not that tough. Um, so at the end, uh, when you get to the seventh round, which is the last round before it moves to a new chain, then you go all the way around the globes one last time, right? When that happens, then the first globe um, projects its um, life aspect into this Laia center or Laia center, right? Uh, and then that's followed by each additional globe passing its life, life aspect into a Laia center before transference on to um, the uh, new chain. Right. Sense? <clears throat> well, thank you. I will study it. Actually, into the new round. Um, well, let me think here. Now I got now I got confused. Let me think. No, into the new chain. This is so at the end of the last round of of the previous chain, the globes each transfer their life into the new chain. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah, it's going to take some repetition. Um, and believe me, that's coming up. Um, she, you know, she goes over and over the same stuff, you know. Um, so, okay. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. All right. Now, before we get to Scott reading, um, Greg has typed in. He says, this is really interesting because from a gravitational perspective, the moon is locked in a dyadic relationship to the Earth. And as a result, a lunar day on the moon is equal to one month on the Earth. Hence, we see the eight phases of the moon. And then he gave us a link for the eight phases of the moon. Okay, good information. Thanks, Greg. Uh, it's actually not a month, it's 28 days, but uh, close to. Um, so, Scott, I think you're up. Okay. The moon is now the cold residual quantity, the shadow dragged after the new body into which her living powers and principles are transfused. She now is doomed for long ages to be ever pursuing the earth, to be attracted by and to attract her progeny. Constantly vampirized by her child, she revenges herself on it by soaking it through and through with a nefarious, invisible, and poisoned influence which emanates from the occult side of her nature. For she is a dead, yet a living body. The particles of her decaying corpse are full of active and destructive life, although the body which they had formed is soulless and lifeless. Therefore, its emanations are at the same time beneficent 
and Maleficent. This circumstance finding its parallel on earth. In fact, in the fact that the grass and plants are nowhere more juicy and thriving than on graves. While at the same time, it is the graveyard or corpse emanations which kill. And like all ghouls or vampires, the moon is the friend of the sorcerers and the foe of the unwary. From the archaic eons and the later times of the witches of Thessaly, down to some of the present tantrikas of Bengal, her nature and properties were known to every occultist, but have remained a closed book for physicists. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, you know, I, I just see, you know, HPP kind of comes into her own when she writes about stuff like this. I could just see her rubbing her hands together, you know. Okay, first, the moon is now the cold residual quantity, the shadow dragged after the new body into which her living powers and principles are transfused. So the earth now carries the same globe D life wave that animated the moon during the moon chain. So far, so good. Next, she is now doomed for long ages to be ever pursuing the earth, to be attracted by and to attract her progeny. Constantly vampirized by her child, she revenges herself on it by soaking it through and through with nefarious, invisible, and poisonous influence which emanates from the occult side of her nature. We get a different teaching on the moon from DK, who, though describing it as a, quote, undesirable form, which must someday disappear, emphasizes that it has no emanation and no radiation of any kind and therefore has no effect of any kind. So we have one of those rare times where we have really different understands interpretation. But there's a, they connect um, uh, on one concept that's coming up. So next, for she is a dead yet a living body. The particles of her decaying corpse are full of active and destructive life, although the body which they had formed is soulless and lifeless. Again, DK's counter is the moon is a dead form and has no emanation at all. Next. Therefore, its emanations are at the same time beneficent and maleficent. This circumstance finding its parallel on earth and the fact that the grass and plants are nowhere more juicy and thriving than on the graves, while at the same time it is the graveyard or corpse emanations which kill. And like all ghouls or vampires, the moon is the friend of the sorcerers and the foe of the unwary. From the archaic eons and the later times of the witches of Thessaly down to some of the present tantricas of Bengal, her nature and properties were known to every occultist, but have remained a closed book for physicists. The difference in teaching on the moon by HPB and DK is at least to some degree explained by this quote from Esoteric Astrology. The influence of the moon is purely symbolic in nature and in effect, and is simply the result of ancient thought and teaching descended to us from Lemurian times and is not based on any true radiation or influence. Then a few lines later, he picks up in Esoteric Astrology, the effect of the moon is noted as a thought effect and as the result of a powerful and most ancient thought form. Nevertheless, the moon has no quality of her own and can transmit nothing to earth. So it would seem that it is this ancient thought form or thought effect that empowers the, quote, witches of Thessaly, the Tantrikas of Bengal, and all the, all others whose magic is oriented to the form side. It reconciles the two points of view, this, this idea that it's really the thought form uh, that animates the uh, nefarious uh, effect of the moon on the earth. Okay, next up, can we get a reader? 
Martha, can you read that for us, please? Well, I don't see her unmuting, so um, let's go to Trudy. Can you read that, please? Such as the moon. Oh, sorry. Sorry, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Such as the moon from the astronomical, geological, and physical standpoints, as to her metaphysical and psychic nature, it must be must remain an occult secret in his this work, as it was in the volume of esoteric Buddhism notwithstanding the rather sanguine statement made therein on page 113, fifth edition, that there is not much mystery left now in the riddle of the eighth sphere. These are topics indeed on which the adepts are very reserved in their communications to uninitiated pupils. And since they have Moreover, never sanctioned or permitted any public, published speculations upon them, the less said, the better. Thank you, Judy. Can I, can I mention about the moon sure. having no, having no uh, physical effect on, on the Earth? That can't be true. Well, not physical. Uh, you said no emanations, no nefarious emanations we know that it that it pulls the tides um and you know we we also you know there's statistics that that suggest that um there's a rise in crime for instance during full moons um you know and other statistics uh talking about the difficulties that um um inmates in in um and um, asylums have during times of the full moon. Yes, that, yes, yes. I've, that heard, I've, I've heard about that. Yes. So you know, how do you reconcile this? Well, I I don't know really how. Um, yeah. But even even planting by the moon has has a an effect. Yeah, plant... absolutely. Yeah, and I I would say that you know uh, DK is not talking about physical effects because they are obvious. Um, he's talking about emanations, and I think those are uh, on more etheric levels. I'll say, thank you. That's what I'm, I'm reading into it anyway. You know, but we, there's no, no doubt that we have a difference in understanding here um, between the two, between first generation and second generation theosophy on this level. I saw a hand shoot up. Uh, yeah. Yes, we've got a hand, but we also have several comments. So um, Greg Greg says, can we also assume then that this thought form is perceived as a quality of thought expression, albeit an old and outdated thought expression, no longer needed in our continuing development, except as a process of releasing and letting go of the past in service to the present, and then on into the future expressions we are meant to work through today? Well, I would say that it, it uh, primarily acts, um, you know, it's interesting, the hierarchy set up um, thought forms about each of the constellations in order that humanity may better actually contact the energies of those constellations. So it, it acts almost as an intermediary between the constellations themselves uh, and our understanding of them through what are called the signs, right? Uh, kind of indicating the difference between signs and constellations. And I think even though the hierarchy would not have set up this ancient thought form about the moon or certainly wouldn't be energizing it now, it acts somewhat in the same way that it's an, it, it acts as an intermediary between the moon itself, which has no emanation, uh, and humanity. Uh, so we are still, even if not consciously 
tuning into it, we are still subject to uh, this Lemurian thought form. You know, and that's how I see it. Next comment. Okay, and then um, Lisa says more babies are born on full moons. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, uh, there could there could be occult reasons for that. Uh, there also could be very practical reasons for that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Won't go any further okay, with that. And, go ahead. And then Robert's got his hand up. Go ahead, Robert. The the idea of the insanity at the full moon. Uh, and other effects is supposedly, it's not due to the moon, it's due to the fact that it is not obstructing the energy from the sun as it does the rest of, uh, you know, that's why we see the moon completely lit up. So when, when we talk about these, these are not results of anything the moon is doing so much as its, its position has shifted and mm -hmm. energy hits the earth with a, an intensity that can cause madness, crime, babies born, whatever. Yeah, and and interestingly, it's just that same phenomena. You know, I like that, Robert, uh, because it goes along with the same reason we meditate at the, at the full moon. Exactly, yeah, the personality. It's is, not the you know, moon, it's the fact that it's been obfuscated or uh, neutralized, you know, you could almost say by the solar energy that is reflected off it. Uh, so in a sense, you're getting less lunar energy then than you are during the normal times. Was that your idea? Well, I think it's a kind of, you know, um, by the law of correspondence, the reason we meditate at the full moon is because the energy available from the soul to the personality is at its maximal point, which correlates with the physical um, because of the light of the sun, the, the light of the soul. The and, idea um, of the form aspect is yes. lit up. You, yes. you, you are, right. you become a, it becomes a vehicle of light. This and of course exactly. that can't be handled, but if people are vulnerable, that you know, that yeah. intensity can crack them, like we were just there talking about in initiation of human soul. We were just talking about that um, yeah, earlier, that um, when you're not ready for this energy and it comes in, it can actually uh, stimulate your lower centers um, in such a way that, well, you know, it demonstrates um, as insanity, um, et cetera, maybe even more babies. <clears throat> good thoughts. Thanks. Okay. That's a good thought. Yeah. Next. Um, Yvonne's, Yvonne's got her hand up. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to read this. Uh, this is from the Full Moon Magic booklet, Why We Meditate at the Full Moon. At the time of the full moon, it's almost as if a door suddenly opens wide, which at other times stands closed. Through that door opening, energies and influences can be contacted, which are otherwise shut off. And through that door, approach can be made to those lives more advanced than mankind and to heights of awareness, which at other times is not possible. That is for the basis for the increase in interest in group meditations at the full moon. So that's from Full Moon Magic. I just thought I'd share that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. I, I believe that's a quote from one of the um, Bailey books on that. Yeah, it sounds like it. You know, interestingly, though, it doesn't get into the why. Uh, why is it that when the moon is full, that that door opens? It just states the fact, you know. Um, Anyone else? And uh, yeah, we've got a couple more comments, but I wanted to say that, um, you know, f I, when I first read that in the Alice Bailey books, of course it made sense to me because the of the alignment. And I think that's the answer to your question there, um, right. uh, Francis. It's the most perfect alignment between the sun, the earth and the moon. Sure. Okay. Yeah. at both the full moons and the um the new moon and that's it's just like in meditation you know the better your alignment is the better the energy flows between um yeah. you know you and your soul or in this case between um the solar energy and the earth um at, at the full moon not obstructed by the moon but um at the new moon it's still that perfect alignment so 
Uh, All right. and, and that's interesting because they both represent perfect alignments, but in the at the time of the full moon, you have sun, earth, moon, which is the uh, which is a more proper alignment for soul identification than uh, sun, moon, earth. <clears throat> anyway, thanks for that. Right, and at the new moon is when they tell us that um, the uh, hierarchy can come through um, better, you know, the transmissions from the hierarchy. So, um, all right, anyway, let me see. Greg says, um, and as Robert states, uh, for that same reason, the new moon can also be an important and intense focus. Hence, if we meditate at the full moon, it is almost as important or more important to meditate too at the new moon because the veil between the world is more transparent. So that's just adding to what we've been saying. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, and Veronica says, a farmer will tell you for a seed to become a plant, it has to be planted at a specific time according to the moon. I can't remember if it is the new moon or the full moon. Um, hmm. Yeah, that's why they have that almanac, the farmer's almanac. Indeed, yeah. Well, thank you all. That's, uh, that actually helped my understanding, uh, especially your comment, BL, about the alignment that makes perfect sense I um, it's perhaps even more important than the fact that the well it's the same uh, reality which is the the moon is completely illuminated as well as aligned with earth and sun you know I think all that together uh, is, is what opens the door um, at the time of the full moon okay um, and sorry and, and Martha adds I'm sorry, I'm going to call you Farmer Martha. It's the waxing moon when one plants for best results. Okay, the waxing moon when when okay. So as you're coming out of the new moon towards then you plant. Okay. During that whole two week period. Um I'm I'm guessing. But if you want to know more, grab yourself a, a farmer's almanac or I'm sure it's online as well. Okay, let's see what we, uh, where we are here. Um, so she's talking about the dark arts and the, and about the eighth sphere, etc. So indeed, info on the dark arts and detailed info on the eighth sphere is better left unpublished. But we are permitted a cursory glance. This chart shows entrance into the eighth sphere adjacent the subplanes of the lower man, mind, rather than being placed beneath the physical subplane of the cosmic physical plane down here. Uh, for it is an overdevelopment of lower mind, along with a total lack of love, that precipitates the pilgrim into these far shadows from which we're told there is no return. This quote is from the above cited Let's see, let me go back here, see where it's cited here, Esoteric Buddhism, page 13, 113. This quote um, is from the above cited page in Esoteric Buddhism. Could we get a reader, please? Okay. Um, Robert, I'm going to ask you to read this after you ask your question. Which comes first? Whichever. Okay. Well, go ahead and ask your question. Oh, okay. This brings up the interesting question of what is going on with planets that have multiple moons. <laughs> and That's, secondarily, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's an interesting thing to, to think about. Secondarily, if one were able to blow the moon out of the sky with some sort of advanced weaponry, the intensity of life on Earth would become truly extreme. Yeah, maybe too extreme to withstand. Right, yeah. so that the, the moon serves a function, a kind of mod yeah. moderating function in a strange way, just yeah. like the personality probably does too. Yeah, it's a, kind of like the way um, it steps down energy from other planets when it, when it um, uh, what sort I'm looking for, BL? 
when it acts as a when it veils veil 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 thank you yeah when it veils planets there's a there's this you know a quality of of uh, changing the nature of the vibration of the planet it's veiling uh plus sending it through that fourth ray filter of the moon uh, but that's another subject let's go right. ahead and read this okay uh, the spheres of the cyclic process of evolution are seven in number but there is an eighth in connection with our earth our earth being it will be remembered the turning point in the cyclic chain. And this eighth sphere is out of circuit, a cul-de-sac, and the bourne from which it may be truly said, no traveler returns. It will readily be guessed that the only sphere connected with our planetary chain, which is lower than our own in the scale, having spirit at the top and matter at the bottom, must itself be no less visible to the eye and to optical instruments than the earth itself. And as the duties which this sphere has to perform in our planetary system are immediately associated with, with this earth, there is not much mystery left now in the riddle of the eighth sphere, nor as to the place in the sky where it may be sought. The conditions of existence there, however, are topics on which the adepts are very reserved in their communications to uninitiated pupils. And concerning these, I have for the present no further information to give. One statement, though, is definitely made, these that such a total degradation of a personality as may suffice to draw it after death into the attraction of the eighth sphere is of very rare occurrence. From the vast majority of lives, there is something which the higher principles may draw to themselves, something to redeem the page of existence just passed from total destruction. Thank you, Robert. Any thoughts or questions? Um, we have a go ahead sorry we have a couple of more comments um about the moon uh mary says we have to ask walter pullen about the moons um <laughs> about the effect of the moons and other planets like saturn and, and jupiter right you could you could go nuts if you were a citizen of one of those planets trying to keep track of when the full moon was and then Greg says, um, and then there's the question of the Lapika Lords of Karma and their um, Davic relationships. To the moon. Okay, good. And anyone else? Nope, that's all I see so far. Okay, so Senate describes the eighth sphere which is what we're talking about here, as more dense than our globe D, the Earth. DK places its origins in lower mind. Quote, much has been hinted at in certain of our occult books about the eighth sphere. I would suggest that in this linking factor of intelligent mind, we have a clue to the mystery. When mind becomes unduly developed, and ceases to unite the higher and the lower, it forms a sphere of its own. This is the greatest disaster that can overtake the human unit. Chilling stuff. Um, but we're not done yet. De Peruker describes the eighth sphere as an actual globe. Could we get a reader for this? Uh, yes. And and p can you read oh I and parker yeah yeah is she yes. yeah okay I'm here thank can you. you hear me mm -hmm. yes hear okay the planet of death moreover shells of this nature lost souls do not remain for any great length of time in the atmosphere of this earth but like straws floating near a whirlpool get caught up by and dragged down in that terrible maelstrom, which hurries off the failures towards disintegration. In other words, to the planet of matter and death, the mental as well as the physical satellite of our earth. That's from the Theophysist, um, September 1882, page 312. This somber planet is what at different times has been called the planet of death or the eighth sphere, or the realm of Mara. As a globe, it is slowly dying and therefore is in its last round. 
It is almost a corpse and is properly called in two ways, the planet of death. It is of material so dense, so heavy that we with our relatively ethereal bodies and the relatively ethereal physical substance around us do not perceive it as a material sphere. However, there are rare occasions when due to a number of converging causes, including the materializing influence of the moon, certain individuals may catch a glimpse of it in the moon's neighborhood. The reason that we do not see it is that very gross or material substance is as invisible and as intangible to us as is highly ethereal or spiritual substance because both planes are different from our physical plane. Further, this planet of death has a retrograde motion of rotation, fountain source of occultism 346. Thank you, Anne. Fascinating stuff. Um, um, and, you know, uh, any source, um, some of these sources you have to, uh, um, well, let's just say you need to consider them all at once and decide for yourself. Um, you know, for instance, um, De Peruca, who wrote this, it literally says it's out there. It's a planet. You know, it exists and it's so dense that we can't see it, which is in itself a very interesting idea. Something if, that is more dense also goes beyond that ability to see. Um, other uh, theosophists don't consider it so much a physical location as a kind of loca that you uh, move into, but it's quite graphic. Uh, I saw a hand. Uh, yes, hold on a minute, Robert. Uh, Mary says, I want to clarify, Walter Pullen did a presentation at the last conference on Jupiter's moons, their names, their meanings, etc. His software helps you find each one of the planet's moons in your natal chart. And she says, I'd never thought about that before his presentation. So I went and, and looked up the link for it. Walter's um, freeware is called um, Astrolog, and it's an absolutely fascinating program. It has esoteric as well as, um, you know, traditional astrology in there, and it's got three-dimensional. I mean, it's got uh, star maps. It's it's absolutely amazing, but um, I'm sorry. I get a little enthusiastic yeah. with that. That's um, you know, I cry myself to sleep every night because I, I'm on a Mac. And I, I can't run Walter's uh, software. But yeah, if you have a PC, uh, do yourself a favor and, and uh, download his program. It's truly amazing, the stuff he has uh, and continues to um, develop on that platform. Nobody else has done that I know of. Um, it's, am it's amazing. Um, and then uh, Loxman says, and this does not imply the moon nodes, but rather a planetary body. Yes, right. It's yeah, but you know he does associate it in terms of the position uh, with the moon. That's those who have been able to see this planet, um, which is in its last round, uh, is uh, catch a glimpse of the moon in the moon's neighborhood. It says so. It. it it would seem that it is nearby the moon if it in if this is indeed true at all you know I, you won't you don't hear none of this is reflected in dk's writings uh, though i find to peru a uh, a credible source in general so anyone else and then robert go ahead yeah i just want to add that so much about um, the moon and the a sphere, it, there's so many blinds and all kinds of um, hidden information. There's a lot of, of science out there in the last hundred years about the moon actually being an unnatural thing in terms of it's constructed. So if you Google spaceship moon, you'll, you'll find that out. In terms of the eighth sphere, my sense is that just you know the, the diagram, the constitution of man, which has the seven planes, I think the eighth sphere is in like an eighth plane below the physical. Um, well, with, with, 
with all that that leads to. Well, I, yeah, but I will go back here. Uh, when the mind becomes unduly developed and ceases to unite the higher and the lower, it forms a sphere of its own. That's the eighth sphere. This is the teaching I, I will put it up above all the others, right? Um, and yeah, but location in terms of location, if one could even talk about such things, it's probably not on the mental plane itself, but is actually within this diagram, i.e., you know, like if, as if you were talking about an eighth chakra, which is lower than the base chakra, then you can end up. I'm not sure about that. Um, well, I'm not I mean, either. You know, if, you go, <laughs> if you go with the Peruker's thing here, you know, it's, it's and also Sinnott says it's of a denser materiality. Um, but H, HPV kind of tosses um, Sinnott aside by her comment. And yeah. I myself, I'm not a big fan of the Peruker, but anyway, just for, uh, that's my two cents. Okay. Um, yeah, well, he, he, I quote him a lot, and a lot of what he says is is really on, in in my estimation. But I think you know, this is, you know, this is the coin of the realm for us, you know, uh, DK. And so, you know, one way you could interpret it, if you want to hold to the idea that it is a, a plane below the physical plane, is that entrance to that is at this point, because he tells us and no, um, you know, this is not ambiguous in his terminology, right? He says, you, it, um, when you be, the mind becomes unduly developed, it forms a sphere of its own. Well, I like what you're saying. It, it's almost as if one could fall, you know, like gravity pulls it down to the very bottom. Remember the key word I think is density. It's denser even than the physical. Anyway. Yeah, okay. So, you know, the idea here, we bring up all the possibles um, and the ideas that have been formed about it uh, without really being able to make any definitive and final statements. But these are the thoughts that have come forth about this idea. Okay, let's go ahead. And all right. We have another hand, but hold on just one minute, Tom. Okay, we've got more comments. Um, Joe says, I've never heard of the planet of death. However, the great fear humanity has of death might be explained as the impact of this planet on us. Oh, that's, yeah, I like that. The realm of Mara, yeah. Anyone else? Yes, and then Greg says, this idea of the planet of death seems relevant to how modern science defines the gravitational properties of the black hole, like the one in the center of our galaxy, and that other black hole outside of our galaxy, that they were able to measure its properties in the last couple of years when we discovered the huge black hole outside of our galaxy. Yeah, um, it was an amazing discovery that at the very center of this galaxy is a black hole. But um, uh, you, one would really have to consider its its the concepts associated with the black hole to to relate it to this type of of negative mental density, right? It's, I think it would be maybe a mistake to too quickly um, consider this concept and the black hole as the same. Now, I'm not saying that's not uh, a possibility, uh, but since it forms the, the center that allows the galaxy to exist, you know, and that the galaxy is a great cosmic being, then you you know you have to wonder about uh, calling the very center of that galaxy a negative black hole. I mean, a negative planet of death kind of black hole. That's just talking about philosophically, you know, gravitationally or density-wise, there are a relationship, but um, the, otherwise, it there's some questions that arise from that idea. 
Anyone else? Uh, yeah, we've got a couple more comments, but Tom's had his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Tom. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, about the eighth sphere, I have used to think like Robert in a way that the eighth sphere would be some kind of border to bring some kind of ring pass knot and, and it goes to the, the other di dimension. And But you, you, you put forward that uh, phrase from from DK I'm not a native speaker so I, I cannot interpret it no. do, do you have to do you have to interpret it so strictly that that he puts it on on some mental sphere because I read it so that it gives a clue uh, some kind of analogy so I I couldn't read it from here definitely that it has to be on on mental level all I'm saying with this is that it is the entrance point you know, through overdevelopment. Uh, and, you know, the real key here is ceases to unite the higher with the lower. So it acts almost as an impediment that keeps the soul from relating to um, the jiva and incarnation, right? right. It, it's, it's like it becomes opaque um, and, and blocks the energy from moving from the higher to the lower. I think that's the real key. And then as a result of that, it forms a sphere of its own, right? Yeah, but I read it that this sphere is just analogical to the eighth sphere, but it's not the same as the eighth sphere. But I don't know if it's so clear uh, in English. Well, you know, he says up here, certain occult books have, much has been hinted at certain occult books about the eighth sphere. So he is addressing that subject here right um but this is a hint uh, this is a clue to the mystery okay but uh, yeah <laughs> still remains unclear yeah uh, and i think mostly it's not described or talked about uh, we're given these few little windows uh into it um, we will uh, see who is right after fourth initiation then. Thank you. I'll see you there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Any we got it. We have another hand up, but first, um, and Veronica says, is he talking about the mental uh, plane of our planet? Let me, I'm, I'm thinking about that. Well, you know, the mind he's talking about here is lower mind. When mind becomes unduly developed and ceases to unite the higher and lower. So that would be on the lower mental plane that this does could and does occur. And in other of his writings, he, he describes the extraordinary lower mental capacity of the dark or certain of the dark brothers because this is what they have put all their energy into, right? And so that reinforces this idea. And then uh, Mary's got her hand up. Yes, Mary. Just to, I think I, I just to corroborate with what you're saying, Francis, I think I agree that this linking factor is in the intelligent mind. In Brazil, we have this religion that's very common, spiritist, and they it's very common sense for them that there's this big planet, they call the big planet, Planetão, and that humanity, after we pass on to a higher frequency, and humanity as a whole gets in passes through the first initiation or, or second, then the ones who refuse to go through that change and, and decides to be in the materialistic world mm -hmm. will be transferred to this supposedly big planet. That's so, interesting. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, DK says that in the next round that um, two-thirds of humanity will uh, identify with the soul and move into the higher realms, uh, and that one third will not. I have always taken that to mean uh, that they will then um, move on to a 
a scheme within the solar system that can provide them with the opportunity to develop at, at the place they are. That is a, a, a much better option than the idea that they they go into what's described here as the eighth sphere, um, which basically ends your the possibility for you to progress during this Mahamanvantara, you know. Um, so there is that distinction. But thanks for that information. That's quite interesting, Mary. Okay, um, okay more hands, more comments. Uh, this um, one. <laughs> Greg, Greg says in this solar system. I, I need more than that. Okay, I think he's talking about what you just said about yeah, um, um, the ones that aren't going to advance. Oh, yeah. I mean, you were saying that on the earth. Then, yeah, the one third that's not going to advance, they're going to, you said that, I mean, you said in this you solar said system. That, Correct. In this solar system. So, like another yeah. planet in this solar system or yeah you know i i you know one good candidate would be that they would they would uh, reincarnate uh on the mars uh uh um, or something uh, the scheme that they would reincarnate oh. on the mars scheme because they would have in their lack of progress re retrogressed to the level where they, the Martian humanity is. That's just a possibility. That's not a teaching. That's just a possibility. There's other other possibilities as well. We just don't have enough information to know. But we do have that definite teaching that uh, two thirds will move forward and one third will drop out. Right. Uh, this is what the Christians call Armageddon, and that's what. DK cites that as well, that it's the Christian Armageddon. <clears throat> More hands? Uh, yeah, Yvonne's hand went up and then down. Go ahead, Yvonne. Okay, I just wanted to reinforce what uh, Francis just said. I think it said they'll be transferred. Uh, they're not going to be punished. They'll just be transferred to another planet to proceed at their own pace. Yeah, uh, that was my memory as well. I mean, that's that's bad enough, isn't it? To, you know, to not be able to move with, with the bulk of humanity. I mean, that's. But see, the the idea that it's a whole third of humanity suggests that we're not talking about the eighth sphere here, because if if you remember, see what is he? Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. We just have uh, to watch the news. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, let's see. Was it De Bruyne here? Yeah, he says that. Um, Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, I one of them said, oh, maybe it was uh, very rare occurrence, right? The, the, um, it's such a total degradation of a personality as may suffice to draw it after death into the attraction of the eighth sphere. It's a very rare occurrence. And DK echoes this idea. Um, you know, and then he goes on to say that but from the vast majority of lives, there's something which the higher principles may draw to themselves. Um, so I, I don't think that at all applies to the Armageddon scenario and one third of the of the population. Okay, next. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, hold on a minute. I was I was trying to look up the references in the DK books, um, but I didn't get very far. Okay, so. Um, Vivian, sa Vivian says we are developing large databases, repositories of artificial intelligence we have created. Uh, yes. It, I, I don't think that's the same as, as this idea uh, that DK has, which is I don't think those databases would act as a block between the higher and the lower. lower. You know, yes, they are lower mental, uh, but they don't constitute uh, what would, in my mind, develop into um, an eighth sphere in and of themselves. Um, you know, for some, they could be part of that 
a, a development, I suppose. Anyone else? Biel? Oh, sorry. Yes. Teresa says maybe the so maybe the souls creating their own lower sphere are pulled in or attracted by the death planet. So they merge into it. AI and human consciousness trapped for a time. Yeah, well, you know, we could <laughs> you could look at the personality as a kind of temporary eighth sphere, you know, because we're out of soul contact. Remember, it's, I always think of that phrase in, in the great invocation, you know, um, uh, which is uh, may the let the plan be restored, right? And that we're out of uh, may the plan be restored on earth, let the plan be restored on earth, that we're not in the that circle of where the plan is functioning, you know, as an earth, let the plan be restored. So, um, and that is a kind of uh, temporary separation of which the eighth sphere is the an absolute separation, right? Oh, uh, anyone else? Yeah, lots and then another hand. Okay, um, Greg says, I think other occult teachings suggest that Hitler descended to one of those other planets considered his second death. Uh, yeah, it's possible. I haven't read that information, but certainly possible. Anyone, uh, next up. Uh, Lisa says, from what I understand, some of this split of the two thirds and one third is due to choice as well. Okay, I don't remember that aspect of it, um, but choice does play into uh, our spiritual movement, you know, and a continued choice to not respond to the soul um, could land you in that one third. You know, especially when you consider the progress that is outlined, even for the next two root races on this planet. And we're talking about a whole next round where you move through the planets on a whole higher octave. You know, um, it, it would be an extraordinary thing to have not uh, become soul infused by that time. It's a very, very, you know, you're talking about whole globes of root races. Um, you know, if you just, if, if say this happens in the fourth globe of the next round, then you're talking about seven whole globes, 28 root races, you know, and the difference between this root race and the very next one is so dramatic. The average consciousness in the next root race will be higher mind and, and, be illumined by higher mind. That's one root race. And you're talking here about um, what may be 28 root races away. So it seems extraordinary um, that a third of humanity would not have um, made, made the cut, so to speak. Of course, you know, we don't really know the parameters of what the two thirds um, have accomplished and what the one third has not accomplished. You know, maybe a, a bar much higher than, for instance, just soul contact. I don't know. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, a couple more comments, but Robert's had his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Robert. HPB always likes to, frequently likes to point out that Earth is the only hell and that this is a Vici that we live in which is very similar to the Gnostic teachings, which always right. makes, me, makes me nervous that maybe I'm one of the laggards who didn't make those transfers to the, to the next dimension. I wonder if anybody else feels that too. <laughs> Don't answer that. <laughs> is, is anyone else nervous? Just nod your head. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, again, I go back to that idea of, you know, let the plan be restored on Earth. Um, until that plan is restored, it's also the idea of the yugas, that we're in the uh, 
this lowest of the yugas. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we've passed the midway point of that lowest. And that kind of goes with moving from the fourth to the fifth root race. At least we're on the upward line of the parabola of, of moving back towards spirit, you know. Um, but, you know, when will the plan be restored? Uh, and until that time, certainly the three worlds of human endeavor can be called hell or avici yeah i think you're right that that the plan the fact that we're out of alignment with the plan is a big deal and that uh, i think somewhere in cosmic fire dk says humanity is the most glamoured of all incarnate lives well that's us fellows well sure yeah because we're astrally polarized more than any uh, anything, any other group. And so that's where the glamour is. Well, let's just join hands and keep pushing forward. Sounds good, Robert. <laughs> Next. Okay. Um, hold on, Yvonne. Uh, Teresa says, interesting book from, oops, um, from Gan Shishapur to Silicon Valley by Paul Emerson, referencing to the eighth sphere from Steiner's teachings. Oh, that so. would be worth looking at. Yeah, you know, Steiner is, um, you know, when you buy it on the Steiner coin, you know, uh, it's it's it feels like it's not counterfeit. You know, his teachings are good, so you know that might be worth looking taking a look at. But the coin of the realm is right here, you know. Anyone and then, else? Um, yeah, we got a couple more comments and then Yvonne's got her hand up, but hold on. Okay, so Mary says, um, Robert, not only nervous, but also scared not to make the same mistake again and miss the next opportunity. <laughs> and then she's got a uh, laughing uh, yeah. emoji there, so. And then um, Lisa says, I think it feels like hell because we can experience duality. Yeah. Yeah, it's, we're caught in that realm where duality is the governing uh, energy um, on all three of the subplanes that we participate in. I think that those little smiley faces and emojis are what people look like in the Vichy. Thank you, Robert. You know, that, that may end up being the most profound of all your comments. Next up. Yvonne. Yvonne. Uh, you got your hand up. Go ahead. I just wondered uh, this eighth sphere. Uh, do you think maybe that's the home of the Dark Lodge? And also, as far as Steiner, I think he's on the same plane as Blavatsky. I love Rudolf Steiner. Oh, yeah. Great stuff. Um, the Dark Lodge, those in the Dark Lodge are certainly likely candidates for movement into the eighth sphere. Um, you know, DK says we are, we're all unconscious black magicians. That's one of those teachers, and it always gives me a chill. Uh, but the key word is unconscious. You know, uh, for those very, very few who choose to become conscious black magicians, to resist the path and to develop um, their power aspect and their mental aspect then they're in danger of um, becoming used by the Black Lodge. And if you persist life after life after life and you sink lower and lower uh, into th that darkness, then you, um, you might transfer to the eighth sphere. So even being in the Black Lodge is not... Um, automatic can you know you're not automatically in the eighth sphere at that point um well in fact if you're incarnate on earth um well that brings up another question doesn't it can you be incarnate and still be in the eighth sphere i don't know um i would think not i don't think you could function in this relatively higher realm um uh, once you have entered the eighth sphere, which would suggest that all incarnate black magicians have not yet reached that most dire place of getting sucked down into that great 
into that eight sphere. Okay, anyone else? Wow. I just want, I just wanted to add that um, this discussion reminds me of what DK tells us about, um, you know, the stages of um, discipleship, you know, we, we, well, not the stages of discipleship, but, um, you know, we go through that stage of being the mystic, where it's all on faith, and we really develop that strong faith. And um, then we become the um, practical mystic and we come out of our little cave or our monastery and we start being interested in the world around us um, and then from there we go into the occultist but the stage of that mystic is so important so that it keeps us from going down that um, left-hand path hmm. um, you know and and then when you think of the petals and the way that they unfold and how they're supposed to unfold the first tier first um, and then the second tier and then the third tier and each of the tiers have those knowledge petals and the love petals and the sacrifice petals but how depending on our rheology some of the petals may unfurl out of order oh, or sir. may unfurl easily more easily than others do so if those love petals um you know if the the mystic part of us is hampered in any way then we are in danger of um you know this um eighth sphere but if there's a chance that somewhere along the line they're just inhibited but could continue to unfold um you know, and, and basically save us, I guess, is is what I'm trying to say. But, you know, all these conversations that everybody's had, that's what that brought me to is the fact that the, the best path, the most logical path is to go from the mystic to the practical mystic and then to the occultist, you know, from the three knowledge petals unfurling first to the three love petals unfurling uh, next to the three sacrifice petals, um, you know, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Right. Good. Thanks, Bill. Anyone else? You think that's it for the moment. Next really? slide, quick. Yeah, really. Okay, can we get a reader, please? Uh, Karen, can you read that for us, please? Yet without treading upon the forbidden ground of the eighth sphere. Too late. Made... What? No, I say it's too late to not tread on the forbidden ground of oh. the eighth sphere. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I just inserted a joke. Go ahead. Oh, gosh, and I missed it. <laughs> um, it may be useful to state some additional facts with regard to ex monads of the lunar chain, the lunar ancestors as they play a leading part in the coming anthropogenesis. This brings us directly to the septenary constitution of man. And as some discussion has arisen of late about the best classification to be adopted for the division of the microcosmic entity, two systems are now appended with a view to facilitate comparison. This subjoined short article is from the pen of Mr. T. Subaru, a learned Vedantin scholar. He prefers the Brahmanical division of the Raja Yoga. And from a metaphysical point of view, he is quite right. But as it is a question of simple choice and expediency, we hold in this work, we hold in this work to the time-honored classification of the trans-Himalayan our hot esoteric school. Thank you, Karen. Okay, first up, yet without treading upon the forbidden ground of the eighth sphere, it may be useful to state some additional facts with regard to ex monads of the lunar chain, the lunar ancestors, as they play a leading part in the coming anthropogenesis. Okay, first of all, the the quote coming anthropogenesis she's referring to 
the second volume of the Secret Doctrine. The X in X monads of the lunar chain refers to the chain, not to the monads. They are still monads, which in reference to our Earth chain are our lunar ancestors who um, manifest on the first globe of each new um, round and established the um, quality of that round. And these are the lunar monads, the lunar lords, also called lunar ancestors. Can we get a reader, please, for this? Uh, Robert, have you read for us yet? Okay, let me read here. It's, it is then the moon, that one? Yeah. It is then the moon that plays the largest and most important part, as well in the formation of the earth itself as in the peopling thereof with human beings. The lunar monads or petries, the ancestors of man, become in reality man himself. They are the monads who enter on the cycle of evolution on globe A and who, passing around the chain of planets, evolve the human form. At the beginning of the human stage of the fourth round on this globe, they ooze out their astral doubles from the ape-like forms which they had evolved in round three. And it is this subtle finer form which serves as the model round which nature builds physical man. These monads or divine sparks are thus the lunar ancestors, the Petries themselves, for these lunar spirits have to become men in order that their monads may reach a higher plane of activity and self-consciousness. Should I continue? Yeah, continue. The greater builders are the solar pictures, while the lesser builders are the lunar ancestors. I would here explain the occult meaning of the word ancestor as used in esotericism. It, liter it means literally initiatory life impulse. It is that subjective activity which produces objectivity and concerns those emanatory impulses which come from any positive center of force and which sweep the negative aspect into the line of that force and thus produce a form of some kind. The word ancestor is used in connection with both aspects. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, Greg's got his hand up. Go ahead. Um, uh, it's, this is really confusing in terms of I mean, we talk about these monads and then the lunar monads and then the petries and then the um, what it what it brings back to me is this thought on the Lepika lords who end up being removed from the earth, I mean, from the moon and then transferred onto the earth chain with uh, as the moon stuff gets transferred onto the earth chain. Am I, am I thinking in the right way? I mean, are the lunar Lipika lords the same ones that we're talking about here? Yes, you've got a little bit of apples and oranges going on. We're talking about, okay, first of all, uh, the lunar ancestors um, are those that developed on the moon chain. The Lipika lords, it's a whole other thing. Those are lords of karma and they, um, exists. They're much higher beings and they exist um, throughout all the rounds and all the chains for all the planets, right? That's a different classification. Um, but the lunar petries, also called the lunar ancestors, are those human beings from a, the moon chain that developed uh, and they were successful to the point that they were th that they established they established the new form for human evolution on the next round. So um, you know, just don't mix up your terms there. Petri and ancestor is the same. Lunar petri and lunar ancestor. In their fact that their lunar designation means that they. Um, came into being or they developed on the lunar or the moon chain and that they inhabit this first globe of the earth chain in order to um, establish the, the 
you could say the norms for the development of humanity for this round. Next, anyone else? Okay, let's see here. Yeah, hold on a second here. Um, Robert says, I think, oh, I, anyway, it was to me. Oh, okay. never mind. All right. Um, okay. Okay, next up. This brings us directly to the septenary constitution of man. And as some discussion has arisen of late about the best classification to be adopted for the division of the microcosmic entity, two systems are now appended with a view to facilitate comparison. The subjoined short, short article is from the pen of Mr. T. Subaru, a learned Vedantin scholar. Okay. So what we're about to study is an HPB era exposition on the constitution of a human being. The second theosophical generation put forth by DK is similar, but with, but it definitely, it has certain definite differences. So by now we've become familiar with T. Subaru, who is quoted often in both the Secret Doctrine and in Old Diary Leaves. This photo shows him with HPB in 1884. Finally, he, Subaru, prefers the Brahmanical division of the Raja Yoga, and from a metaphysical point of view, he is quite right. But as it is a question of simple choice and expediency, we hold in this work to the time-honored classification of the trans Himalayan Arhat esoteric school. So Raja Yoga aims to control the intellect and the thought forms it creates through meditation in order to break one's identification with lower mind, lower self in general. It is called Brahmanical because it was initially designed, uh, designed for and used by the Brahman or priestly Indian caste. The Trans Himalayan school represents teachings that come from the Trans Himalayan lodge with which HPB was affiliated and DK is a member. There's, you know, many of the masters who lived at Shigatse, um, those masters were of the Trans Himalayan school. Here's a statement on this lodge from externalization of the hierarchy. Could we get a reader, please? Uh, yes. Laxman, can you read that for us, please? Uh, certainly. I would like, first of all, to make one point clear. The great hindrance to the work of the majority of the esoteric schools at this time is their sense of separateness and their in intolerance of other schools and methods. The leaders of these schools need to absorb the following fact. All schools which recognize the influence of the Trans Himalayan Lodge and whose workers are linked, consciously or unconsciously, with such masters of the wisdoms as the Master Moya or the Master KH form one school and are part of one discipline. There is therefore no essential conflict of interest, and on the inner side, if they are in any way functioning effectively, the various schools and presentations are regarded as a unity. Thank you. Who was it just spoke? Uh, Laxman. Thank you. Okay, next, uh, we come to this chart at the bottom of page 157 here. Um, and she says the following table and its explanatory texts are reprinted from the Theosophist of Madras. And they are also contained in five years of theosophy. And now we switch authors from HPB to T. Subaru. And he says, we give below in a tabular form the classifications adapted, adopted by the Buddhist and Vedantic teachers of the principles of man. The way we, uh, then we have the title septenary division um, in different Indian systems. 
the left column uh, of the chart entitled classification in esoteric Buddhism is the one usually used by HPB era theosophists. Notice that the listing, which puts the dense physical at the top, is the reverse of how DK lists the vehicles. Since these terms will be used throughout the rest of the secret doctrine, we're going to take a close look at all of these ideas. Uh, don't let the Sanskrit throw you. Um, the, the, print, the concepts are um, very approachable, but often the, uh, the Sanskrit knocks you out in terms of um, getting a sense of what he's talking about. Okay, at the bottom of the page, um, is shown the subplanes on which the principle being described is found. Okay. So I've inserted this, which is, as you know, DK Theosophy, to get a, a better idea of what the where these principles reside on the cosmic physical plane. Um, so could we get a reader for this lowest level? Okay. Um, first, Joe's got her hand up. Go ahead, Joe. Francis, this is a simple question. The first column has seven. The second seems to have six and the third four. And I'm, I just don't understand how this is laid out. Well, you will. Um, and <laughs> you're not going to in the next three minutes, but definitely in our next session, uh, I go into uh, great detail as to how these all relate and how this works. Okay. Thank you. Uh, but the quick, quick answer would be that these brackets, um, uh, enclose principles. So, for instance, the the Stulopadi uh, in the Taraka Yoga includes the pranic vehicle, right? It includes the gross physical and prana, right? So, um, you have, well, that's all I can say right now. Um, okay. <laughs> you know what, folks? Um, I think uh, we shouldn't embark today because you know we're just right there at 2:43 or at 43 minutes out to the hour wherever you are and so what we'll do is hold off um, until next time to actually get into the weeds on these uh, on this terminology and that way uh, we won't have this month long um, time gap between um, you know reading this material and then It'll be more of a piece. In fact, it's a really great place to stop for that, for that very reason. So, um, could we get um, uh, dates for the next sessions? Yes, our next secret doctrine is on track. It's on the nineteenth of February at eight p.m. Our next. Secret Teaching of All Ages is a little off track. That's going to be on the 29th of January at 8 p.m. It's a week and earlier than it would have normally been. Yeah, it's a week earlier. And your next um, PCF um, is on the 27th of January. That's also on track. So everything's on track, except for that the secret teachings is a week earlier. You know, the best thing to do whenever you have questions, go to moriafederation.com and, and uh, you can see the listing there. So when you, if you have any doubt. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for attending. That's a very interesting discussion today on the eighth sphere. That seemed to be, you know, it seems like each one of these webinars has this point where there's this great interest and then we have uh, a lot of discussion and um, so I enjoyed that today. Um, it's always better when we get a lot of, of interest around some subject. So I'll see you, uh, let's see the very next one will
be the 27th, which, what is that? Is um, that? It's a, fr that's a Friday. That's Friday. The so that's the very next webinar yeah. will be Treatise on Cosmic Fire. So. Yeah, and it's going to be a Francis weekend because we'll have <laughs> the Friday and then we'll have the Sunday, so. Yeah, just like Goodbye, this. Bye, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. I'm going to read the chats here. Um, give me a moment to look. Okay. All right. Then. Yeah. I just... Okay. See you next time. See ya. Okay. Bye bye.